And that valiant warrior came with his following. It was at first light. The captain of his company to where the king waited to see if by some means the swear of all would work a turning into this tale of sorrow. The man excellent in warfare walked across the hall, flanked by his escort. The floor timbers boomed to make his address to the Danish lord, the guide of Ingvai. He inquired of him whether the night had been quiet after a call so urgent. Hrothgar spoke, the helmet of the Skildings. Do not ask about our welfare. Woe has returned to the Danish people with the death of Ashir, the elder brother of Remlath. He was my closest counsellor. He was keeper of my thoughts. He stood at my shoulder when we struck for our lives at the crashing together of companies of foot when blows rained on boar crests. Men of birth and merit, all should be as Ashmere was. A bloody, a bloodthirsty monster has murdered him in Hirot, a wandering demon with his terrible one glorying in her prey, glad of her meal to return to, I know not. She has taken vengeance for the previous night when you put an end to Grendel with forceful finger grasp and in a fierce manner because he had diminished and destroyed my people for far too long. He fell in that struggle and forfeited his life, but now is followed by another more, most powerful ravager. Revenge is her motive, and in furthering her son's feud she has gone far enough. Or thanes may be found who will think it so in their breasts. They will grieve for their, giving, their giver of rings, bitter at heart, for the hand is stilled would openly have granted your every desire. I have heard it said by subjects of mine who live in the country, councillors in this hall, that they have seen such a pair of huge wayfarers haunting the moors, otherworldly ones, and one of them, as far as they can make out, was in a woman's shape, but the shape of a man, though twisted, trod also the tracks of exile, save that he was more huge than any human being, The country have called him from of old by the name of Grendel. They knew of no father for him, nor whether there have been such beings before among the monster race. Mysterious is the region they live in, of wolf fells, wind-picked moors, and treacherous fen paths. A torrent of water pours down the dark cliffs and plunges into the earth. An underground flood. It is not far from here in terms of miles, that the mere lies, overcast with dark, crag-rooted trees that hang in groves hoary with frost. An uncanny sight may be seen at night there, the fire in the water. The wit of living men is not enough to know its bottom. The heart that roams the heath when hounds have prevailed uh, pressed him long and hard may hide in a forest. His antlered head, but the heart will die there sooner than swim and save his life. He will sell it on the brink there, for it is not a safe place. And the wind could stir up wicked storms there, whipping the swirling waters up till they clog the clouds and clog the air, making the skies weep. Our sole remedy is to turn again to you, the treacherous country where the country, the creature of sin is, sought, is to be sought out, is strange to you as yet. Seek then before... Seek then, if you dare. I shall reward the deed, as I did before, with wealthy gifts of the wreathed ore, treasured from the hoard, if you return once more. Beowulf, Beowulf spoke, son of Ebsgau. Beat your grief, wise one. It is better for a man to avenge his friend than to refresh his sorrow, as we all must expect, must expect to leave our life on this earth. We must earn some renown, if we can, before death. Daring is the thing for a fighting man to be remembered by. Let Denmark's lord arrive, and we shall rapidly see then where this kinswoman of Grendel's has gone away to. I can promise you this, that she'll not protect herself by hiding in any hole of the field, in any
any forest or a mountain, in any dingle of the sea, dive where she will. For this day, therefore, endure all your woes with the patience that I may expect of you. The Ancient arose and offered thanks to God, to the Lord Almighty, for what this man had spoken. The steed with braided mane was bridled then, the horse for Hrothgar, the hero patriarch rode up shining, the shield bearers marched in a troop beside him. The trace of her going on the woodland paths was plainly to be seen, stepping onwards straight across the profound moor she had fetched away there, the lifeless body of the best man of all who kept the courts of Hrothgar. The sons of men then made their way up steep screes by scant tracks, where only one might walk by wall-faced cliffs through haunted fens and uninhabitable country. Going ahead with the handful of the keener men to reconnoitre, Beowulf suddenly saw where some ash trees hung above a hoary rock, a cheerless wood, and the water beneath it was turbid with blood. Bitter distress was to be endured by the Danes who were there, a grief for the elves, for every thane, for the friends of the, friends of the Skildings, when they found there the head of Ashir by the edge of the cliff. The men beheld the blood on the water, its warm-up swellings. The war horns sang an eager battle cry. The band of foot soldiers sitting by the water could see multitudes of strange sea drakes swerving through the, the depths and water snakes lay on the ledges of the cliffs like such serpents and wild beasts as will sally out into the middle morning to make havoc in the seas where the ships sail. Slithering away at the bright phrases of a battle horn, they were swollen with anger. An arrow from the bow of the bow of Beowulf broke the life's thread of one wave thrasher, wedged in his throat the iron dart. With difficulty then did he swim through the deep until death took him. They struck him as he swam, and straight away, with their boar spears barbed and tanged, gaffed and battered, he was brought to the cliff top. Strange lurker of the waves, they looked with wonder at their grisly guest. The geek put on the armour of the hero, unanxious for his life. The manufacturer of the mail shirt, figured and vast, that must venture in the deep, made it such a bulwark to his bone-framed chest that the savage attack of an incensed enemy could do no harm to the heart within it. His head was encircled by a silver helmet that was to strike down through the swirl of water, disturb the depths. Adorned with treasure, clasped with royal bands, it was right as at first when the weaponsmith had wonderfully made it, but no sword should afterwards be able to cut through the defending wild boars that faced about it. Not least among these mighty aids was the hilted sword that Hrothgar's spoken, spokesman, Unferth, lent him in his hour of trial. Hrunting was its name, unique and ancient, its edge was iron, annealed in venom and tempered in blood. In battle it never failed any hero whose hand took it up, at his setting out on a stern adventure for the house of foes. This was not the first time that it had done heroic work. It would seem that the strapping son of Edgelaf had forgotten the speech he had spoken earlier, eloquent with wine, for he offered the weapon now to the better swordsman. Himself he would not go beneath the spume to display his valour and risk his life. He lost his reputation there for nerve and action. With the other men it was not otherwise it was otherwise once he had armed himself for battle. Beowulf spoke, son of Edgdiel. I am eager to begin, great son of Halfdene. Remember well then, my wise lord, provider of gold, what we agreed once before, that if in your service it should so happen that I am some sundered from life, that you would assume the place of a father towards me when I was gone. Now extend your protection to the troop of my companions, my young fellows, if the fight should take me. 
Convey also the gift that you have granted to me, beloved Hrothgar, to my lord Hijlak. For on seeing this gold, the Geat chieftain Hrethel's son will perceive from its value that I had met with magnificent patronage and the giver of jewels, and that I had joy of him. Let Unferth have the blade that I inherited. He is a widely known man. And this wave pattern sword of rare hardness. With hunting shall I achieve this deed, or death shall take me. After these words, the weather geek prince dived into the mere. He did not care to wait for an answer, and the waves closed over the daring man. It was a day's space almost before he could glimpse the ground at the bottom, the grim and greedy guardian of the flood, keeping her hungry hundred season watch, discovered at once that one from above, a human, had sounded the home of the monsters. She felt for a man and fastened upon him her terrible hooks, but no harm came thereby to the hale body within. The harness so ringed him that she could not drive her dire fingers through the mesh of the mail shirt, masking his limbs. When she came to the bottom, she bore him to her lair, the mere wolf pinioning the mail-clad prince. Not all his courage could enable him to draw his sword, but swarming through the water, throngs of sea beasts threw themselves upon him, with ripping tusks to tear out his battle coat, tormenting monsters. Then the man found that he was in some enemy hall, where there was no water to weigh upon him, and the power of the flood could not pluck him away, sheltered by its roof, a shining light he saw, a bright fire blazing clearly. It was then he saw the size of this water hag, damned thing of the deep. He dashed out his weapon, not stinting the stroke, but with such, such strength and violence that the circled sword screamed on her head, a strident battle song. But the stranger saw his battle flame refuse to bite or hurt her at all. The edge failed its lord in his need. It had lived through many hand-to-hand -hand conflicts and carved through the helmets of fated men. This was the first time that this rare treasure had betrayed its name. Determined still, intent on fame, the nephew of Hijlak renewed his courage. Furious, the warrior flung it to the ground, spiral patterned, precious in its clasps, steel and stiff and steel-edged. His own strength would suffice him, the might of his hands. A man must act so when he means in fight to frame himself a long-lasting glory. It is not life he thinks of. The Geet Prince went for Grendel's mother, seized her by the shoulder. He was not sorry to be fighting his mortal foe, and with mounting anger, to the man hard in battle hurled her to the ground. She promptly repaid this present of his as her ruthless hands reached out for him and the strongest of fighting men stumbled in his weariness. The firmest of foot warriors fell to the earth. She was down on this guest of hers, and had drawn her knife, broad, burnished and edged, for her boy was to be avenged, her only son. Overspreading his back, the shirt of mail shielded his life, shielded his life then, barred the entry to the edge and point. Ejtheal's son would have ended his venture deep underground there. The geat finder had not the battle shirt then brought him aid, his war shirt of steel. And the wise lord, the holy god, gave out the victory. The ruler of heavens rightly settled it as soon as the geat regained his feet. He saw among the armour there, a sword to bring him victory. A giant sword from former days. Formidable were its edges, a warrior's aberration. This wonder of its kind was yet so enormous that no other man would be equal to bearing it in battle play. It was a giant's forge that had fashioned it so well. The skilding champion, the shielding champion, shaking with war rage, caught it by its rich hilt and, careless of his life, brandished its circles. 
and brought it down in fury to take her full and fairly across the neck, breaking the bones. The blade sheared through the death-doomed flesh. She fell to the ground. The sword was gory. He was glad at the deed. Light glowed out and illumined the chamber with a clearness such as the candle of heaven sheds in the sky. He scoured the scoured the dwelling in a single-minded anger, the servant of Hijlak, with his weapon high and holding it so firmly, he stalked by the wall. Nor was the steel useless yet to that man of battle, for he meant soon enough to settle with Grendel those stealthy raids. There had been many of them he had made on the West Danes, far more often than on that first occasion when he had killed Hrothgar's half-companions, slew them as he, as he slept, and in their sleep ate up of the folk of Denmark fifteen good men, carrying off another of them in foul robbery. The fierce champion now settled this up with him. He saw where Grendel lay at rest, rest limp from the fight, his life had wasted through the wound he had got in the Battle of Herot. The body gaped open as it now suffered the stroke after death from the hard-swung sword. He severed the neck. And above, the wise men who watched with Hrothgar the depths of the pool descried soon enough blood rising in the broken water and marbling the surface. Seasoned warriors, grey-headed, experienced, they spoke together, said it had seemed unlikely that they would see once more the prince returning triumphant to seek out their famous master. Many were persuaded the she-wolf of the deep had done away with him. The ninth hour had come, the keen-hearted shieldings abandoned the cliff head, the kindly gold-giver turned his face homeward. But the foreigners sat on, staring at the pool with sickness at heart, hoping they would look again on their beloved captain, believing they would not. The blood it had shed made the sword dwindle in deadly icicles, the water all wasted away. It was wonderful indeed how it melted entirely, as the ice does in the spring, when the father unfastens the frost grip, unwinds the water's ropes. He who watches over the times and seasons, he is the true god. The Geet champion did not choose to take any treasures from that hall, from the heaps he saw there, other than the richly ornamented hilt and the head of Grendel. The engraved blade had melted and burnt away. The blood was too hot, the fiend that had died there too deadly by far. The survivor of his enemy's onslaught in battle now set to swimming, and struck up through the water, both the deep breaches and the rough wave swirl were thoroughly cleansed. Now the creature from the other world drew breath no longer in this brief world space. Then the seaman's helm came swimming up strongly to land, delighting in his sea trove those mighty burdens that he bore along with him. They went to meet him, a manly company, thanking God, glad of their Lord, seeing him safe and sound once more. Quickly the champion's corset and helmet were loosened from him. The lake's waters, sullied with blood, slept beneath the sky. Then they turned away from there and retraced their steps, pacing the familiar paths back again as bold as kings, carefree at heart. The carrying of the head from the cliff by the mere was no easy task for any of them, brave as they were. They bore it up, four of them, on a spear, and transported back Grendel's head to the gold-giving hall. Warrior-like they went, and it was not long before they came, the fourteen bold geats marching to the hall, and among the company walking across the land, their lord the tallest, the earl of those thanes, then entered boldly, a man who had dared deeds and was adorned with their glory, a man of prowess, to present himself to Hrothgar. Then was the head of Grendel, 
held up by its locks, manhandled in where men were drinking. It was an ugly thing for Earl and their queen, an awesome sight. They eyed it well.